This episode of About That with Marga Ortigas is brought to you by Salamanca's own Las Olivas del Oro. Also wanted to say a quick hello to Cousin Fatima and Doña Almodena. Read more about it in The House on Calle Sombra. Brought to you by Penguin Random House Southeast Asia. Available at a book retailers near you or through Amazon globally. Hi. How are you? Wow, I haven't seen you in ages. I know. You know, I feel like it was yesterday that you and I were sitting in the Palestine Hotel in Baghdad. Harris Whitbeck, an international correspondent from Guatemala who spent 20 years reporting for CNN. And yeah. here I am just entering like a new phase in my in my work life and in my creative life and it's and it's wonderful. He recently published a memoir written in Spanish, the title of which translates to the trade of telling stories fearlessly, where he re-examines what he's seen while on assignment and deeper truths about his family and himself. There's like this deep space within me that I can tap into, and I discovered it when I was writing. You're still yeah. doing work with TV news though, right? Yeah, I am. You left CNN how long ago? I left CNN in 2000, uh, 2009, 2010. I mean, oh, it's okay. been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. And I completely, like, just, like, when I left, I left. You know, I, yes. I, I touch with very few people, to be very honest. Um, I kind of, like, landed at Discovery, hosting the Latin American Amazing Race. I don't know if you're familiar with that reality. Yes, of course. And it literally landed on my lap. A friend of mine who was running Discovery Latin America called me and said, what are you doing, Harris? And I was like, well, I just love CNN. And she said, have you heard of Amazing Race? And I said, I have no idea what that is, of course. And then uh, she she told me about it. And I thought, you know, why not? You know, and so. Yeah. Harris Whitbeck está a punto de cubrir una nueva historia. The Amazing Race and Discovery Channel. I did like three seasons of that. It was It's quite a change to go from, you know, journalism and what you and I have done to go into entertainment and that led to my uh forming a, a production company in miami that was doing reality shows oh wow uh, okay so i ended up like uh, producing mexico's next top model and all this silly stuff <laughs> that is quite <laughs> was, did you enjoy it was, it? You, it was i enjoyed i mean i enjoyed the challenge of learning something new right but um i eventually yeah, i wanted to get back into news and so i it, well that ended and I, I i met my now ex-husband who is from guatemala and we came back here and i started freelancing for al jazeera and for okay. cgtn harris whitbeck al jazeera san pedro sula so how long was your gap between cnn and the next news adventure I'd say five years, maybe. Okay. And even when I was even when I was producing in Miami, I mean, we produced a couple of documentaries that were news, you know, news driven. I I did one on uh, on uh, the technology developed by drug traffickers, both by traffickers and by law enforcement. Yeah, and that was really interesting, and that kind of like kept me in news. And then uh, you know, so I did stuff like that. But yeah, it's been uh, kind of full circle, and now I'm freelancing, and it's great. What is it about? doing the news you think that's gotten under your skin well I mean after having done it this long but you've also come from a long line I think of storytellers going by what you've said in your book well you know it's funny I I guess I well I didn't realize it was in my blood until I actually really started doing more research for this book but I always knew from a very young age that this is what I was going to be doing I just had like an instinctive feeling that this is what my my path was and it seemed absolutely natural to me you know to to do it so i never had that like that you know like that mm. as it existential angst that one yeah. might have as a teenager about what's going to go on i just went for it and and i guess that's why i came back to it but was it news in particular like did you know oh there's a job that exists that is reporting because as a kid i remember i didn't even know that that existed as a profession but were you already aware that that role existed, somebody who would go and do stories about real life. Yes, I did. And see, the thing is that when I was growing up in Guatemala, when I was, a, you know, a, a teenager in the early 80s, mid 80s, 
there was a civil war going on here. And there were a lot of U.S.-based, well, Western news organizations were coming into Guatemala to cover the conflict because it was the years of the Cold War. You know, Reagan was in power in, in the U.S. and the Soviet Union and Cuba were, you know, obviously kind of like fighting, trying to get their 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 way into control, you know, having, having more influence in Central America, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala. So there were a lot of... Um, U.S. network crews who would come into Guatemala, and I had a job. I was working, uh, tending the newsstand at like the major international hotel where all the press would stay. And so I would see these these glamorous television correspondents come in, and and I befriended them. And I got one of them to uh, allow me to go with them to cover some riots in Guatemala right. City. I mean, I was 16 years old. My parents never knew, but um, <laughs> I, ended up, I ended up covering, you know, like carrying the tripods for them, and just really yeah. like absorbing everything that 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 I was seeing and then um, that eventually led me to you know to go on to my master's degree and then I met people at CN from CNN around that same time and that's how I got in but yeah so I'd see these people and I was like that's what I want to be when I grow up and then what then prompted you to go in to actually write a memoir if you will or the story of how you got into this profession well, because many journalists, right, aren't ones to kind of point the camera at themselves. You're right. And I think that's why I resisted for many years, resisted writing it for many years. And but I, I you know, I'd come home from assignments. You know how it is. You know, I'd come home from Baghdad and with some of the stories of all that crazy stuff mm -hmm. that we do over there and see and feel and smell and listen. To, and and I tell these stories and everybody would say, you have got to write a book. I didn't find what I did to be extraordinary, to be very honest. I felt like I was just doing what I was meant to do and having fun doing it. So I didn't really see why I had it in me to write a memoir. I was like, who's going to read it? And my mom would say, you have to write this before I die. You know how they are. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, so I had it, you know, it was kind of like in there. And then in 2000. Well, and then over the years, I would try, I would like sit down and write a paragraph and absolutely nothing would happen. It just would not flow. So I'd put it down and forget about it. And then, you know, and that went on for several years. But then in the fall of 2019, my my now ex-husband and I were in Spain and um, we were, it was a really like very difficult time in, in my life. Like, you know, the relationship was changing and I wasn't getting any feedback and blah, blah, blah. I had been reading about microdosing psychedelics. Okay. I had been reading about this trend in Silicon Valley and how people are really using these substances to hack their brains and be more productive. And, and I was intrigued by it. I had never really done any drugs, before, right. but I was intrigued by the fact that these were being applied in a, in a very controlled, safe setting. And so I had that in my mind. And I remember one morning in Madrid after some blowout, I just Googled psychedelic therapy and this retreat came up in Amsterdam and I just went for it. I just applied for it. Okay. I mean, it was, one of, it, was, it was one of the craziest decisions I've ever made in my life. But I just deep down inside, I knew it was right for me. As I was preparing myself for this session, I set intentions. And okay. I had a psychologist friend work with me on setting those intentions. And one of the three intentions I set was to understand why I wasn't flowing creatively. And... I got the answers I needed. I mean, it was just, I mean, it was just clear as daylight how I understood in my mind what, when I was tripping, why I wasn't being creative. And as soon as I got back home from this trip in Amsterdam, I started writing and six months later, I had a book. Wow. So then what did that teach you about how to deal with the creative block? Well, I mean, to be very honest, I don't really understand what happened, but I can tell you that while I was tripping at one point, I was... I was kind of like navigating in this beautiful, luminous white space. And there was this very like childlike, playful music in the air. And suddenly these giant gummy bears showed up and they encircled me and started dancing with me and, and, and just being playful. And I felt like I was a child again. I don't know if you remember that, that uh, children's board game called Candyland. Does that yes. mean well? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I felt like I was in Candyland and I'm, fi I mean, I was um, 50, Five years old when I did that. Okay. Um, 
but but these gummy bears they started whispering in my ear and they whispered yeah. one particular word and that word was calliope and, and they were like insistent insisting calliope calliope and so the next day after i came out of the trip i looked it up and calliope was the muse was the greek god of creativity okay. and that just blew my mind i have no idea i i, I have no idea why it happened i don't know if subconsciously i had you know surely in some history class i had read about calliope and then mm -hmm it just triggered it i don't really know i don't really know what the process was but i don't care because it worked it's um, six months when, that's quick okay. six months was quick and i came back and then i started just writing just you know, i don't know how you write but usually i what i did was i like set aside a block of time in the mornings from 7 a.m to 1 p.m and just write i had saved all of my old reporters notebooks i have boxes right. and boxes of reporters notebooks so I, I i organized them into you know like chronological order and then working with my editor, we saw what material I had, and he'd start guiding me, asking me questions. So why don't you write write about Iraq today? So I end up writing a whole chapter on Iraq, and then I'd write like random chapters, and then he, as a good editor, kind of like helped me put it all together. Right. But it was a very organic process. No, that sounds great that you could do that, and that you were able to finish it in six months. What did you learn? Did you learn about yourself? from that whole process that you didn't maybe grasp before it? Well, I learned I learned I could do it. Um, I think I uh, part of the reason I had resisted writing a book was I was terrified of the idea of writing. You know, I was trained, and you'll understand perfectly when I say this, but I was trained to write in minute 30, minute 45 bursts. Very short sentences, very concise, very to the point. And I was very good at that. I mean, I, yes. we got really good training at CNN. Yes. And, and, and so the idea of going from that kind of writing to writing a full, you know, 186 page book or whatever, it was really, really terrifying to me. So to be able to do it, I learned that it's in me. <laughs> I learned that I was much more introspective than I thought I was. And I learned that during all of those reporting years, I had actually absorbed a lot of really deep lessons that didn't really manifest themselves at the time because I was so focused on getting the news, getting my mm. reports on the air and, you know, dealing with everything that surrounds being in war zones, as you know. Yes. Um, but decades later, going back decades later and revisiting those situations, I, I, I just discovered all these beautiful life lessons that, that I, I so cherish now, you know. How detailed were your reporter's notebooks? Was it mostly were, just notes about the story you were doing, or did you also put down anything else that might have crossed your mind at the time? Like, oh, there was everything. I even found, like, at my reporter's notebook from Venezuela back in uh, 1993, 94, I had jotted down a cell phone number, just a random cell phone number, but and then the name next to it was Lieutenant Colonel Lugo Chavez. <laughs> The people of Venezuela are no longer under the strong control of their president, Hugo Chavez. Who, you know, at the time he was, you know, like this, you know, Venezuelan army officer trying to, you yeah. know, do whatever he was. But so I had like, you know, I wasn't very organized. I mean, the, my notes were organized to me, right. but maybe to the producer I worked with the most, but not to anybody else. So I'd have, um, you know, random quotes from a press conference or, you know, details on how to get to a feed location back in the day, or even, you know, like an airline itinerary and stuff like that. Even that feed locations, they don't have those anymore, do they? It, what's a feed location? <laughs> exactly. No, but have you... <laughs> Notice, because you're still working in the industry, and there's been such a change now from certain generations of journalists to the younger ones that I see nowadays. And even the way they record things, like we all had notebooks. I, I like you, have boxes and boxes of notebooks. But people nowadays don't seem to have that anymore. And they're recording things on their phone. If not, they're just taking snapshots or just pressing the record button on a video. Do you find that that actually might also change the way a story might affect them. Yeah, I do. I think it, it, it's it's concerning to me, and I don't want to sound like this old fogey, you know. But but when you think of it, when all you have to do to react to something or to absorb some information is press a button, something has got to be lost there. You know what I mean? I mean, to me, the process of even even if jotting down a scribble that only I could understand, it invested me more in what I was absorbing. 
And then I'd have to go back and read the notes. I still do. I go back and read the notes and and, and decipher them and 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 you know put them into context and all that. So I spend more time with the information. And my concern is that this new technology doesn't allow for spending enough time with the content to actually absorb it and treat it and give it the treatment it deserves. Yeah. Well, I, th- I mean, I think I think there's some wonderful storytelling going, you know, uh, taking place now. I, I'm not in any way diminishing what's being done today. I think it's become easier in, in, in many senses. I mean, I remember when I was, you know, back in the day before we even had, had cell phones. Yeah. You know, or, or that, you know, like portable cell phones. I remember fantasizing about having like a, a television lens implanted in my forehead and just like pulling on my left earlobe and you know, right. making the camera click and stuff like that you know you, you can almost do that now <laughs> yes that's true they just put a cap on and it pretty much works the same way you're right exactly exactly right. yeah and- so um, it's gotten easier and I think there's a really good storytelling going on but I do sometimes just like yearn for more for more context and more more um, gravitas as one of my CNN bosses used to put it you know gravitas just taking the time to breathe into the story and and really feeling it and and sensing where it's going to go before just like putting it out there that's the thing how do you think then one generation can pass down to the next certain elements of the storytelling that they might have done for the next yeah. guys to take on and run with as opposed to Because it's the same thing, you know, you have the seniors that we worked with in the field and you pick up things from having worked with them. And nowadays, there's not even that anymore. And a lot of the younger guys will just go off on their own and figure it out. Yeah, it's it's very different, as you say. And um, is it even important? Is it important then that they still learn from a older generation? I mean, I think so. I mean, look at like back when, when, when you and I were in Baghdad, what was that 2003, 2004? Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was one of the junior correspondents back then. And, and uh, I, I, you know, work alongside some of the great names in journalism or, you know, correspondents, producers, camera, you know, camera people, mm-hmm. and would learn so much from them. Just learn, learn from watching them, like gather the, re- the elements during the day and then, you know, see their finished product at night and understand how they got to where they wanted to go in terms of the storytelling and the narrative and the characters they chose and the, you know, the underlying issues that they wanted to address. Um, that's, I feel so lucky and grateful because that's what form, informed my journalism. Today, I mean, when I get asked and I speak at, you know, I speak at universities and, and, and whenever I speak to younger, younger journalists or students, they always ask about, they ask about the technology and they say, well, isn't it better now because we have so much more technology at hand? And my answer is that technology is very good, but it only works. It's only good if it comes hand in hand with, as I said before, with um, respecting the context respecting the story letting right. the people tell the story and, and verifying those facts which is ba- you know journalism 101 yeah what for you then makes a good story i think it's letting the story tell itself if that makes any sense i always uh, took the route of letting a pe- a person's story tell the story you know if if i'm covering a natural disaster you know just uh, obviously humanize it very much and let those who are most affected tell it and and give the context i don't think that will ever change you were reporting in both English and Spanish for yes. CNN. You had CNN Espanol, and then you were doing um, CNN as well in English. And your book is written in Spanish. How do you think then? Do you think in a marriage of the two languages, or is there one that takes dominance over the other? I think it depends on on the context. It depends okay. on, um, you know, I mean, obviously, when I'm here in Guatemala, Spanish is 90% of my life. Uh, even though I work in English, I report and write in English when I'm freelancing. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I was obviously when I was writing the book, I was in Spanish most of the time uh, and thinking in Spanish. So I don't know. I, I don't. That's a hard question because I just go back and forth between. Mm-hmm. It's like a very. They just. It just kind of flows. But as I was saying earlier, for some reason, writing the memoir, it felt much more natural and to just write in Spanish. And I did start to translate a couple of chapters to try, I'd like to shop around to see if it, I think there would be interest in English, but I found it really difficult to translate my own work. I don't know if that happens to you, but you know, I think I'm, I'm so invested in the content that when right. I, that I translate, you need to take like a step back and look at it from, from the outside a bit. And I got through a couple of chapters, but they just read, they felt very stilted to me. And so I haven't really done much with them. 
how would you describe the differences? I mean, there are obvious differences in the way you might write a book as opposed to the way you would write something for TV. Which one appeals to you more or what has each given you that the other doesn't? Well, they're just, they're just such different processes. And, you know, right now in my TV work, I do more like long form reporting. I do like, you know, 15 minute pieces, um, which is great because you have all this time to tell a story. But sometimes it's hard to fill 15 minutes of television after you're used to writing a minute yes. 30 story. And every now and then I'll get like a breaking news assignment. And I, my, my assignment is to bang out a minute 30 piece and do a live shot. And it's come to be so easy for me because I've, I've learned to like, you know, write the longer. So now to go back to do the minute 30 pieces is a piece of cake. And, you know, I mean, obviously I do my, I'm very, I take it very seriously and do the required yeah. reporting around it. So there's that, which I love. And then the writing the book, what I love about writing the book is the process. You know, I'm, we're here at, my, here at my lake house right now in Guatemala, which is the most beautiful spot in the world. And, and here I would, I would wake up at 6.30 in the morning, pour myself a cup of coffee, which is pretty like religious for me, and then block out four hours of my day to just write. Sometimes I'd write a paragraph, sometimes I'd write an entire chapter, but to have that almost like sacrosanct period of time in my day and allowing myself that time to just let it flow, whether it float or not, no money in the world can buy that feeling, you know, and it's, it's, I miss that, but you know, you get caught up in life. What can I say? Yeah. Do you find it's almost meditative, isn't it? When you sit down and write like that. It is the- just letting it flow. Yeah. And, and, and it's meditative, but it also makes you be fully present in a really strange way. I've been uh, thinking a lot and reading a lot about the importance of being present and, you know, the past is the past and doesn't exist anymore. And the future doesn't exist either. So really all we have is now. So I've really been like trying to apply that philosophy in my life. And when you sit and write, even though you're projecting yourself to another reality or another, you know, somebody else's other reality or the past or the future, it's still to me very much an exercise in being present because you have to be fully in touch with yourself in order to to access that those words that are going to be coming out of you that's that's very well put i completely agree that's exactly are you able to then because of that deal with any kind of creative block differently now or has that not been a problem anymore i i've no longer i'm no longer intimidated by a creative block and if if i feel a creative block coming on i just welcome it and accept it for what it is, because you can't really fight a creative block. I mean, you know, if you're blocked, you're blocked, you know, right. I mean, you can like sit there and stare at that screen. And, you know, if the words aren't there, they're just not there, you know. So I think I've learned the, uh, the power of acceptance, right. <laughs> in every aspect of my life, and that includes creative blocks. And I understand that sometimes creative blocks serve a purpose. Because, you know, you start thinking about what you're trying to say in a different manner, or a different manner pops up. And then if you're just, if you just surrender to it, then it just unblocks by itself is is my feeling. That's a great way to put it. I've never quite heard it put like that, but you're right. You know, there's quite a lot of gems in your book. One of my favorite ones, which I've underlined is... um, about fear. Fear is basically just the lack of information or is born of a lack of information. Where was it that you feel that first came to light for you where you kind of go, okay, I've learned this. Yeah. Yeah. It's very clear to me. I was uh, in uh, in the fall of 2001, shortly after 9-11, you know, Afghanistan was in the news and Afghanistan was the story that everybody wanted to be on. And I, of course, wanted to be there. But my entire childhood and and adolescence, again, having grown up in a war-torn country, was informed by fear. You know, I would hear the the maids in my house whisper about death squads, and they'd hear about death squads on the radio. And I'd go to bed at night fearing not the, the monster who will come get you in the middle of the night, but fearing a death squad, not really understanding what it was. So that was my first inkling that fear is a lack of information because if i had the information and this is terrible but if i had the information the fact that the death squads would never show up at my house because my family was a very conservative you know establishment family the death squads went after dissidents i wouldn't have been afraid you know so decades later i go to afghanistan and i get the assignment i remember i was in um, in paraguay 
uh, researching an investigative piece on Hezbollah and their activities in, in South America, laundering money for, you know, for terrorism. And I got a call from, my, from the assignment desk and they said, okay, do you want to go to Kabul? And my first reaction was, absolutely, I want to go to Kabul. Mm -hmm. And my second reaction was like, oh, shit. Yes. <laughs> you know? <laughs> You know what? Where I'm going? You know, you know, it's the first like major, big scale, large scale conflict I had ever covered. I, I had no idea. I, I started imagining all these scenarios, including, you know, the assignment desk calling my parents and saying I had been, you know, something had happened mm -hmm. to me. And then when right before I left for the airport to fly over to Afghanistan, the head of assignments asked me for my list of kin, of uh, uh, right. uh, next of, because they had to have that information logically, but yeah. that. It scared the hell out of me. But by then I was like, you know, invested in it. So I, and I really wanted to go. So I went there. I was throughout the whole journey, which was Atlanta to Mexico City to Paris to Moscow to Dushanbe, and then you know, overland across mm -hmm. the Afghan border. I was I was terrified. The minute I crossed the border into Afghan territory and I saw, you know, armed men and I could hear the B-52s flying overhead and I was like living in, in the theater of war, the fear dissipated completely. It just went away. And it just went away because I just got into the present. You know, I had to like shoot interviews. I had to like find a translator. I had to find a, a way to feed my story out. I had to like, you know, just like focus on the moment. And that... That is when, to me, I realized that what I had was a lack of information. And if that void had been filled with information, it wouldn't have been filled, filled with fear. So it was a very empowering moment in my life. The first time I went to Baghdad, I was with you. We were in a convoy from Jordan together with a guy who hitched a ride. The Washington Post. Yes. I was, it was an incredibly heady moment. So always, always, always appreciate it. And I think it goes back to what you said about being present. I think because everything was so heightened, everybody was so present. I, I don't think there yeah. was anybody there worrying about the past or thinking about the future. Exactly. Yeah. How necessary do you think it is to have storytellers? That's what keeps societies together. I truly feel that the fabric of a society is based on shared stories. So storytelling, I think storytelling is more important now than ever. So I'd say to those who are starting out, it goes by really quickly. It goes by so quickly and just like enjoy the moment. And the process is much more important than the finished product. I mean, I, I learned so much more crossing the Hindu Kush, trying to get to the Bureau in Kabul. I just so learned so much more about the country that informed my reporting than if I had like just like flown right in. Uh, the process was just as important as the final, as the final result. As Harris said, it was the process of writing the book that he enjoyed. But the final result also made a profound impact. You know, was it Martin Luther King, The Truth Will Set You Free? To me, it was absolutely liberating to write everything that I wrote and to know that what I wrote was out there. Because, I mean, that book, I speak about things that, you know, that were out there, but maybe weren't. But I spoke mm -hmm. about how conflicted I felt about being a teenager, wanting to be a journalist in Guatemala. And my father was a member of a very questioned conservative uh, military right. government. And, and I just like spelled it out, spelled it out what I felt. And it's funny because that chapter, I wrote it weeks after my father had passed away. So it was an oh. incredibly emotional body of work and emotional process to get that out there. But it was absolutely liberating. And then, you know, I, I, I wrote about my sexuality, about how difficult it was growing up gay in, in, in Guatemala in school. And, you know, there, I have nothing to hide. And that is the best feeling in the world. So, Have yeah. you had any kind of fallout from it or no? Has it been just acceptance? It's been it's been wonderful. There's been absolutely no fallout. And there's been no fallout from like for, here in Guatemala. Guatemala is very polarized politically mm -hmm. and across the political spectrum. I was worried about the chapter about my dad, but I got nothing but really good comments and good reviews about that chapter and about the rest of my life. It's like... Once you put it out there, people just, I think you realize that it's not as important to other people as you think it is. Yeah. And then obviously, you know, to tell, to come out openly and say that I've, I've ingested psychedelics, even though they, it was in a legal controlled therapeutic setting, you know, that's not for everybody, yeah. but you know, my mother, she had trouble with that chapter. Oh, okay. That more but than the one about had, your dad? 
Yes, yes. Okay. But she uh, she's from a different generation and she's come to learn a lot more about it and understand it now. Right. I think everybody who picks up the pen or starts typing a book is brave. So I commend you, especially that when you're writing about it's a different kind of bravery when you're writing about yourself. Well, thank you. And I commend you because it takes takes a lot to do it to do this. Thank you, Harris. And thank you, listeners. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Harris's book is available globally on Amazon, and hopefully there will be an English translation soon. I'm Margot Diaz. Catch you again next time.